sidekick here in Microsoft Flight Simulator with the Big Radials P40B Tomahawk. With, and, well, this was originally going to be sort of a review of the model because, um, to be absolutely transparent, uh, Big Radials provided me with a review copy and I really wanted to make a review video. But then um, I found something out. I really did not fly this plane very well, and I didn't feel like I could review it, so I've actually had to spend a fair bit of time not only learning how to fly the P-40, but going back and reviewing just warbirds in general. And I kind of wanted to make a video about the P-40, but I also wanted to make a video a little bit about the challenges of flying warbirds in, let's call them, modern flight simulators like uh, Digital Combat Simulator, uh, Microsoft Flight Simulator 2020, and, and probably uh, IL-2. A little bit as well. So um, this is kind of going to be a combination of a review of the P40 uh, model, which really does deserve to be reviewed and, and does deserve to be tried, by the way. Uh, but also a little bit about my musings on, on why I have found it so difficult um, to learn to fly this aircraft. I won't say master it because I'm nowhere close to that. But anyways, uh, let's, um, let's jump in the cockpit, get the airplane started. We can talk about all of that as we go along. Okay, here we are in our P-40, cold and dark. We're at the Gatineau Airport in Gatineau, Quebec, across the river from Ottawa. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. And the flaps and gear levers are in the correct locations. And we're just making sure we got our mixture to cut off, propeller forward, crack the throttle about a quarter inch. All of that looks pretty good. We have fuel in both of the wing tanks and the fuselage tank. So we'll go to fuselage for the fuel selector. For the checklist, all of these are the this is the checklist coming from the big radials manual, by the way. Parking brake is on. Carb heat is cold because we would push it to make it hot. And we're going to open the cow flaps all the way. And now we're ready to start the start sequence. First, we're just going to get the switches on. Battery generator, lights, fuel pump. Yeah, we're going to put the fuel pump on. And we need to get the ignition, prime it once. Uh, we still haven't put the magnetos on, so there's not going to do much point in starting it. So we get the, the ignition on. Left, right, and both. All right. Clear prop. And we're going to push the switch down to energize the starter. Out to five. And then we're going to... Oops. Didn't work. Let's try that again. Push down, count to five. Push up. And when it catches, advance the mixture to auto rich. And it looks like we have a good start. We're just going to get our RPMs up to about a thousand. And we're checking our temperatures and pressures. Oil pressure is coming up. Oil temperature is still pretty low, but it's coming up slowly. Coolant temperature is also low, so we're just going to have to leave it idle there for a little while. So, we're here at the Gatineau Airport, because the Gatineau Airport is the home of the Vintage Wings Collection of Canada, which is a collection of vintage aircraft owned by Mr. Michael Potter, and which actually includes the P-40 Tomahawk. Uh, you may have seen uh, some videos about Vintage Wings. There's a gentleman named Dave Hadfield. Uh, who frequently posts videos flying the Vintage Wings Canada. He's their chief pilot. And uh, so I thought that this would be an appropriate place to go fly the Tomahawk. So we're just starting to taxi here. Our, coolant, our oil and coolant temperature is still not quite as high as we'd like, but we do have a long taxi ahead of us, so it's probably okay today. And just try and keep moving here. So as I said, if you want to see some uh, excellent videos of flying actual vintage warbirds, then Dave Hadfield's videos are a great place to start, including one that he has done on the P-40 Tomahawk, and I think if you check the Big Radials website, you'll also find uh, that Dave Hadfield has a credit as an advisor to the program. So um, I spent a lot of time watching that video to see if I could try and figure out more of uh, what I needed to do to fly the aircraft properly, so I kind of thought this was an appropriate venue to do the flight from. Now, unfortunately, the Gatineau Airport is not well modeled at all in Microsoft Flight Simulator, something that, oh, if I, if I can get the courage to do some work in the SDK, I might try to fix because I think it's a, uh, an airport that's definitely worth having done in high fidelity, but that's a project for another day. 
for today we're just going to try and get our uh, P40 out to the runway so we're out uh, going down the taxiway and doing the classic sort of S turn thing so the question of uh, flying the P40 and what I've had to learn to at least get to the point where I can actually get the aircraft off the ground and on the ground again uh, without damaging it at least not in the sim so with the P-40 there are basically, in order, uh, of the difficult things you learn how to do, have to learn how to do, are first, landing, second, taking off, third, taxiing, and fourth, engine management. So luckily we're going to leave the worst of those to last, since we won't have to land until the end of the flight. Uh, we're working on taxiing right now. As you can see, um, the main thing about taxiing is uh, definitely do it with the... Uh, canopy open if you can so you can lean out the sides. Um, do not um, let the speed build up too much. Um, with tail draggers you can't apply the brakes very firmly or they will nose over on you so uh, P40 is no exception to that so you don't want to get it going so fast that you have to feel like you have to stop it in a hurry. And of course you can't see anything over the nose so one trick that I found in taxiing at least on the runway that's wide enough is instead of just S turning all the way down the runway I'm just driving next to the center line and keeping it in view, uh, uh, kind of leaning out the left-hand side of the cockpit and watching the center line, it seems to work fairly well. So the main thing is just to modulate your speed, and remember with uh, one of the things about uh, these old piston engines is that, um, and and the, uh, the constant speed prop modules, is that uh, the RPMs do respond a little bit more slowly than you might be used to. So just because you put the boost up doesn't necessarily mean that the prop follows. So um, it does take a little while for power to build, but then it also takes a little while for the power to drain off. Find once the aircraft is moving, um, it does hold its speed pretty well. It's pretty uh, slippery on the ground. I'm not sure if that's realistic or not, um, but it definitely means you don't want to taxi with a lot of power on it. So we're getting down to the end of the runway here. We're going to pull off to the right, then we're going to swing around, and we're going to uh, do a little bit of a run up now that we've finally gotten uh, our temperatures up close to where they should be. We're probably actually going to have to warm up the engine just a little bit more before we do that. So that brings up, well, let's talk a little bit about engine management. The engine management engine does require a little bit of attention, like in any warbird. Um, you basically have to make sure that it doesn't overheat, which would, it will have a tendency to do if you're not careful. Overheating will be a combination of running it at high power, but also running it at low airspeed. So, for instance, on the ground or in the climb, and that's why you want to pay attention to your cow flaps and make sure that they're set appropriately. So if you're climbing, um, you want them in combat climb. Um, if you're on the ground, you want them full open. And then you also want to make sure you respect the limits on how long you should have the, uh, the power up above um, its maximum, which is really 40 inches of boost is the practical maximum, but 35 is really the cruise. Okay, so you can see our temperatures are a little bit low. We want 60 degrees on the oil temp and about 80, 85 on the coolant temp. So I've closed the cowl flaps and I'm running the engine a little bit above idle, and you can see the temperatures are climbing very rapidly. It's important to get the temperatures up because the engine doesn't really run consistently until the until it's warm. So if you try to uh, do the run up and the takeoff before it's warm, you won't be getting consistent results. So now that it's basically warmed up, I'm going to open the cow flaps all the way, make sure we don't overheat it, and then we're going to do our run up procedure, which consists of uh, getting the boost up to about 28 inches, letting the RPMs max out should be around 23 RPM. 2300 RPM. And then we're going to switch um, uh, from both mags to the right and then the left. And each time we do that, we should see the small drop in RPMs. And this is just to check that both mags are working. Okay, well, there's a small drop there, but it's very small. So I guess the right mag is working. Back to both. We get back maybe the 50 RPMs we lost. Then we go to left. Once again, a very small drop. Then we put it back to both. And you can see that's uh, driven our temperatures up a little bit. We're going to check, make sure the runway is clear. We're going to pull back to idle. And we're going to set our rudder trim to two notches. 
And our elevator trimmed to three notches to get ready for takeoff. One more check down the runway. And I'm actually going to close the canopy. The procedure says you should fly with it open, but it's just one less thing to do after you take off, so I like to close it. So we're going to get out on the, the runway here and take a look at taking off. Now, as I said, this is probably the second most difficult thing to do in the P-40, and uh, full disclosure, I am working with auto rudder on. Uh, just because I still haven't gotten to the point where I can consistently do this with it off. Um, and it's still a challenge. So, we've gotten ourselves out on the runway, and we've gotten ourselves straight, so we're just going to advance the throttle now. I like to keep it around 30 inches of boost until it gets rolling. We get the stick all the way back. Well, let us build a little bit of speed. Now we're pulling the power all the way up slowly, and now the rudder dance is going to start here pretty soon. Just dancing on the rudder pedals, really not keeping our feet steady at all. You can see it really wants to come off the ground, and I'm holding it on until about 115 knots. And then I am pulling up the flaps. Now, it, it probably could have gotten off the ground a little bit earlier than that, but I find one of the, the common errors I was making right at the beginning was to basically try and get off the ground as soon as it wanted to, and then um, it kind of wallows when you do that. Uh, you really want to wait till it's about 115 before you let it come off the ground. Otherwise, um, it doesn't climb out very well. So we've got the gear up, and then we uh, kept the nose down to build speed. We're about 200 uh, miles an hour now. And we can climb out at actually less than that, so we can keep uh, Pulling back a little here, try and get the, even a little bit more climb out of it. Oh, I guess we probably do need to reduce the power as well. So we're going to go back down to cruise climb, which is 35 and 25. 35 inches of manifold pressure and about 2,500 RPM. You can see it's a lovely evening here in Canada's nation's capital. We're flying west towards the Gatineau Hills. That's uh, the city of Ottawa over there on the left. I'm just going to go up to some airspace here over the Gatineau Hills and put the P-40 through its paces a little bit. So while we're getting uh, climbed out here, just, you know, a little bit amusing on flying warbirds in simulators and why they really do, I think, pose much more of a challenge than a lot of, uh, particularly um, kind of modern uh, jet aircraft or, or even to some extent modern uh, general aviation aircraft. And I've been trying to figure out what exactly it is about, uh, that is difficult. I think part of the reason comes uh, from the fact that um, while it's possible to simulate the warbirds themselves very, very accurately, uh, and that's the thing that's really happened in the last few years, is we've gotten very much more accurate flight models for these aircraft. But there are some things that we can't simulate as well that are really kind of important to being able to fly these aircraft in ways that they aren't in some of the more modern aircraft. And the first of these is probably just the uh, the sensation of the controls. In uh, Warbirds, the controls were connected directly to the control services, usually by like a wire and pulley. They were not uh, fly-by-wire in the modern sense. And so when you pulled on the on the stick, you felt the control services bite. The re resistance changed depending on speed, depending on how far the control surface was deflected. And this just is a sensation that you can't reproduce in a desktop simulator with a desktop joystick. Okay, we're out of the airspace where I wanted to be, so let's just start some maneuvering. Let's start, try some maximum rate turns. So I'm just banking the aircraft, trying to get the nose level, and then I'm just going to pull as hard as I can on the stick and see what that does to our speed. So this is basically as tight a corner as we can turn in the P-40. And that's pretty much stick all the way back there. And the speed is dropping slowly, so let's roll up, try it again to the left. I think we'd probably come around a little faster to the left, but I think we lose speed a little bit more quickly, maybe that makes sense. But we're coming down to around 150 miles an hour now, so just finish this turn and roll up. So, of course, that's the other thing that we can't sense in the cockpit that was absolutely essential to flying an aircraft like this, is we don't get the full body sensation of flying them. If I'd been flying that turn in a real aircraft, of course, I would have been pulling significant Gs. 
Um, and I would have actually felt a lot of the things that I needed to feel in order to fly the aircraft accurately. Now, the sims are great about providing sound feedback and a lot of other ways of trying to send you messages about what the aircraft is doing, but it doesn't really replace what you would, you be, you would be feeling if you were actually flying in the aircraft. And that makes it difficult, I think, more difficult to fly warbirds than any other aircraft because they really do depend on that sense of feel, I think. Okay, well let's, uh, let's do a classic maneuver here. We'll just pull ourselves over into a loop. We've gone vertical, get past the vertical, waiting for the horizon to come down. A little bit less back pressure on the stick. Pull the power off a little bit as we come through, put the pressure back on the stick. And give ourselves a nice graceful loop. Well, that was a lot of fun in the P-40. Very nice, easily controlled loop. I enjoyed that a lot. And again, uh, flying that uh, procedure in an actual aircraft would have um, you would have had a lot of tactile feedback. A lot of uh, uh, you would have felt a lot of things that would help you fly it more accurately. You can do it in a simulator. Um, the simulator is giving you enough visual feedback to know how to do it if you practice it. But it's really not as direct feedback as you would get. Now, this is one of the things about flying in VR obviously gives you a lot more of that kind of feeling, uh, but it doesn't really replace the actual feeling you would get in the actual aircraft. Let's do a classic fighter maneuver here. We're going to try and pull up and over into a wing over. The trick here is to get the nose coming through the horizon as the wings go vertical and keep that ball in the center. Pick a target on the ground and let's roll out and really dive in on that target. Do this a lot in Digital Combat Simulator, practicing iron bombing, which is kind of a thing I do there. Oh, this is the edge of the Gatineau Escarpment. We can fly around the corner here. All right, well, if you don't enjoy doing that in Microsoft Flight Simulator in the P-40, then I'm just not sure that we should check and make sure you still have a pulse. All right, well, let's pull back up and do this all the way in. Let's see if I can do a proper chandelle here. All right, pull up, pull up, pull up, pull up, pull up, and finish the turn just above stalling speed. Well, and lost the coordination there at the end. Not a great chandelle, but not a bad try either. Okay, let's get back to cruise power settings, get a little bit of a climb on here. Turn back to the left and head back uh, over town. We've drifted a little bit far to the west here. So as you can see, uh, the uh, P-40 really is a hoot. Uh, it's a great aircraft to fly. Uh, the cockpit is beautiful. It's an immersive experience. I really can't say enough about how much I enjoy flying this aircraft uh, once I get it off the ground and before I have to put it back on. Uh, and those really are the two places where flying a warbird becomes a huge challenge. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But first of all, I feel some aileron rolls coming on here. So let's get ourselves straightened out and headed back to the east here. And there is the nation's capital over there on the right. Lift the nose and try and do a slow roll, bit of top rudder, push forward on the stick, bit of top rudder, well, not enough top rudder. Okay, well, that wasn't too bad, not the greatest roll. Mister, let's try and do it a little faster. That was a little bit better. Whoops! A little bit too much top rudder at the end there. Turned into a little bit of bottom rudder, okay. Maybe one more. There we go. That was better. Love to hear all the sounds going on in the background while I'm doing those. Okay, well, we've kind of rung out uh, the aerobatics uh, of the P-40. Let's actually do some, some testing of slow flight here. Let's just do a wings level stall. So I'm just holding the nose up. Power's all the way back. I'm going to let the speed bleed off, but I'm just going to try and keep the nose level. And... So this is one thing that I found pretty interesting. When I first saw this behavior and, and you know, and then experienced myself, I thought that this was actually probably not correct. This felt like this was just too easy the way the aircraft, what it's basically gonna do here is it's basically gonna go into a stall and it's it's pretty much gonna stay stalled. The nose is gonna drop slightly. Um, but with the stick all the way back, it isn't gonna even drop um, very dramatically, which uh, it was counterintuitive to me. I figured in a high-performance aircraft there would be a dramatic moment when it stalled. 
um, and and it would have a tendency to drop a wing or something, which it doesn't do. So we're now just going to push forward and give it some more power and then come back and build up some speed. So at first I thought that this must be an inaccuracy in the flight model, but then I actually watched uh, some videos, including one of Dave Hadfield's videos test flying the Hurricane, in which he did exactly that maneuver, and it behaved pretty much exactly that way. So hats off to the developers. Uh, whatever you might think, this is actually the way a warbird stalls. Okay, now to get a little bit more dramatic, we'll do a nose high stall, so we'll put it in the climb, and then we'll pull back the power, and this time keep holding it back, keep holding it back. This time we get a little bit more uh, behavior like we're a little bit more used to, where the nose drops and you can't hold it up, and then you just push forward, give it some power, and recover. But in both cases, the stall behavior is very, very benign. But the thing about it is, because it's so benign, you almost can't tell you're approaching the stall. There's no stick shaking, there's no indication. And that's actually an issue um, on landing, because what is happening when you do stall is that you're completely losing control authority as you get into that stall region. And that's, uh, that is actually what can happen to you when you're landing if you're not careful. So, you see, and I've dropped the landing gear. I'm just coming around in a circle here back to the east again and I'm just going to do some slow flight uh, with landing gear and flaps deployed because I found this was actually useful for me to get used to how the aircraft handles at speeds like the speeds we're going to be using when we're landing as you can see uh, we're down to about 120 knots now and so we're going to roll it out here and so I've got the flaps deployed and the landing gear deployed. So to maintain 120 knots and level flight, you can see I am um, well up uh, in uh, the power regime. I'm up, actually up over 40 inches um, and uh, up past 2500 uh, RPM to hold the aircraft in this attitude with full flaps and gear. So you can see how much uh, how much drag that's adding but now you can see as we get slower and slower uh, I literally cannot hold the nose up and uh, although you can't tell I'm losing a lot of authority with the rudder uh, and even ailerons and so this is really the characteristic of what happens if you get going too slow um, the aircraft doesn't react violently it just sort of stops reacting at all and that's really the dangerous thing that you have to be careful of and why when you are actually uh, flying on approach, I found, at least for me, one of the things I really, really have to do is make sure that I keep the speed up. You really don't want to be getting down to that 100, 115 miles an hour, which is kind of really until the threshold. Um, when you're on approach, you want to keep the speed a little bit higher than that, otherwise you just lose the ability to point the aircraft where you want it to go. And here I'm just experimenting with that. Now I'm going to pull the power back all the way. You can see I have to get extremely, with no power on, um, oops, I meant more power than that. <laughs> Forgot to switch the tank. There we go. That's better. All right. Uh, but as you can see, uh, with power off, uh, you can get extremely nose low uh, and not picking up a whole lot of speed. And so that's really the uh, one of the things you need to keep in mind when landing is uh, the aircraft will point the nose very low without picking up speed and we're just bringing the gear up and the flaps up. So when they say in the manual that you may want to approach uh, at a steeper rate of descent than usual, I think that's probably what they mean. Alright, so let's give her some gas, climb back up, just do a couple more things before we go in and land here. and just. You know, my final thoughts on this whole issue of what is making warbirds more challenging to fly um, in simulators these days. And I think, um, I think really it comes down to a combination of that tactile feedback uh, and the lack of sensation and also the fact that, uh, you know, they really were a handful. Because, you know, you've got, uh, as the manual says, 1,200 horsepower out there turning a very large, heavy propeller. It generates a lot of torque, which is quite different than the straight-ahead acceleration you get in a jet. 
in the, in, the, in a jet, a modern jet, you're going to be flying fly-by-wire. You're going to be flying off the symbols on the HUD. That's what real pilots do. Pilots that flew warbirds did not do that. They flew by feel. They had no symbology, and they were directly connected to the flight surfaces. And you can't do either of those things in a flight simulator, at least not very well. Okay, well, let's get ready to go home. Do one more. Do a split S here, because that's kind of fun. Get ourselves come headed into the uh, top of the downwind here on the airport. Uh, we're going to need to cut back the power. Not uh, if this was a real engine, this is probably not a good procedure, uh, but our temperatures are okay, so we're just going to cut back the power and drop down before we start the downwind. And you know, you can particularly see why uh, all of those things particularly become an issue on <clears throat> on takeoff and then on landing because uh, sensing what the aircraft is doing in yaw is one of the things that's very difficult to do. Um, in a simulator without really uh, watching very carefully what's happening, for instance, watching the slip indicator. Uh, in a real aircraft, it would be much more obvious. You would feel yourself moving side to side. Um, and I think that the rudder control would be much more natural because you would feel the, the shifts and that would uh, kind of be transmitted directly to your feet. And that's the other problem. Um, you're using your feet on rudder pedals that really have uh, no tactile feedback. You can't tell whether or not the rudder is grabbing um, by how your feet feel, by how your rudder pedals feel. So it, it all makes it just a little bit more difficult. So we're putting the gear down. Now the procedure here, at least for me, is to stay on down. We'd try and stay more or less level, um, but keep the speed at around 150 miles an hour until we decide we're almost ready to turn base. And we're going to start deploying the flaps and letting the nose drop. So all of which, I guess, maybe is a little bit of an excuse for why has it taken me a month or more of pretty much constant work to get good enough to even make a video about this. But I think there are some reasons, and I think that if you, like me, are struggling to fly these aircraft as well as you would like to, I think there's some really good reasons. And really the only way to overcome them is just to practice. Of course, the hard thing to do is to figure out how to practice right. Uh, and that's been my hardest uh, issue. I can tell that it's not working, but I don't know what to do to make it work. And uh, until you can figure out something that works, you can't really practice it and get good at it. So uh, if you're like me, maybe this uh, video will help you a little bit, A, feel better about the fact that you're struggling, but also maybe I'm showing you some things here that maybe you haven't tried, maybe be useful for you. Um, all right, we're on base. Uh, we've got two notches of flap down put the third notch in just as we come in. As you can see, we're, we look like we're pretty high compared to where we would normally be, but we're going to fix that here in a minute. Now one thing that I noticed that is, seems to be particular to the Tomahawk is that uh, it does tend, I don't know what it is, but it tends to crab a little to the right. If I aim straight, straight down the runway now, I'm going to end up drifting left. So I'm aiming a little bit to the right. And I'm pulling back the power a little, letting it drop. I'm trying to watch that speed. Don't want the speed. See, the speed's even a little lower than I'd like, so I'm adding some power to keep it from going any farther. Don't want to pull up the nose at this point and lose any more speed. Still keeping the nose a little bit pointed to the right, a little bit of left right wing down to keep us straight on the runway. Getting close now. Getting close now. Keep the nose down. Don't let the speed bleed off too soon. I know this is a little bit scary. And now we're going to pull the power. We're going to pull the nose back. We don't want to get three point. We don't want to get two nose high. A little bit of a bounce. And now the rudder dance starts. And hard as I try, this is about as straight as I've ever been able to land this aircraft. Even going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Uh, i got to say, I'm pretty happy with that. Although in the P-40, don't relax until you have really bled off a lot of speed. It does have a little bit of a tendency to ground loop right at the end if you're not careful. Uh, and that's actually, I wonder if there's an issue there with the contact dynamics between the tail wheel and the runway. I wonder if uh, in Microsoft Flight Simulator, uh, if you're at too high a speed, the tail wheel actually skids and isn't very effective at steering. That might be part of what my problem has been. Don't know that for sure. But it has been, eh, it's been a bit of a frustrating journey. But it ended well today, the sun going down here. 
at the Gatineau Airport in Canada's nation's capital, home of Vintage Wings of Canada. Hoping to do a series where maybe I find some of the other aircraft that Vintage Wings owns. And like I said, maybe I'll, I'll get up the gumption to actually try and fix up the airport so it looks a little bit more like the actual Gatineau Airport. Anybody out there who wants to help with that project, I'd love to hear from you. If you enjoyed this video, I really hope that you like the video, subscribe to the channel. And it looks like we're clear of the runway hold line. So, I'm going to taxi out. And for now, this is going to be Sidekick. Signing off.